Hello, and welcome to Nightmare Masterclass. My name is David Stockdale. I'll be your host on this excursion into the dark unknown. In this installment, I'll be dissecting Jordan Peele's latest cinematic endeavor, a horror film by the name of Us. Peele's previous effort, the critically acclaimed and award-winning Get Out, was a film I very much enjoyed. This one is a little more ambiguous with respect to its underlying themes. I didn't quite know how to feel about this film after first having watched it. In fact, I think it took me a couple of days to fully digest what I'd witnessed. This is an extremely weird movie. And, you know, it is one that I would highly recommend. Us practically begs the viewer to interpret the film in thematic terms. It asks you to look beneath the surface and perhaps do some digging to uncover whatever unpleasant things might be hiding underground. So naturally, I thought it would be worth taking a closer look at. Us is about Adelaide Wilson, played by Lupita Nyong'o. At the start of the film, Adelaide returns to a childhood vacation spot in Santa Cruz with her husband and two kids. Adelaide has an uneasy feeling about the trip due to a traumatic experience during her last visit. Her apprehension proves to be justified when the family is confronted by four shadowy figures, people who, it is revealed, look exactly like them. Over the course of the movie, the Wilson family is terrorized by these doppelgangers. Okay, so here's the point where I'm going to say that if you haven't seen the movie, you're going to want to watch it prior to moving forward with this video. I'll be discussing major plot points from this point forward, so consider this your official spoiler warning. So, as it turns out, these doppelgangers are clones of the U.S. population. They're the product of a science experiment gone awry. The apparent goal of this experiment was to carry out some elaborate form of mind control on the American populace. Though it didn't quite work out like that, and the clones were abandoned and left to their own devices in underground facilities. As a result of this experiment, the clones and their original human counterparts are tethered through some otherworldly mechanism. Two bodies, one soul, as it is said in the film. People on the surface live their everyday lives and their subsurface counterparts essentially perform the actions carried out above ground. They're driven to mimic the actions of their surface dwelling twins. They go through the motions of everyday life but lack the same authentic experiences and material comforts of the surface world. Adelaide's double, the aptly named Red, has organized their escape and the subsequent attack, which is aimed at severing the tie between the clones and their surface level counterparts in order to liberate them. Now, as I said, it took me some time to comprehend the events of the film before I really started to notice certain thematic patterns. That said, I interpret us largely in metaphorical terms. That is to say, I consider the family's doppelgangers to be abstract representations of the family itself. The horror evoked throughout the film is primarily derived from the uncanny sense each of these characters feel at the sight of people who somehow look exactly like them, yet seem to be from another world entirely. So, what aspect of the family members do these doppelgangers represent? Well, the film works on a number of levels. At a certain base level of interpretation, we can understand the film purely in terms of the individual psychology of the protagonist. I would say our protagonist, Adelaide, has a serious case of imposter syndrome. This is a psychological phenomena in which one experiences a sense of intense doubt with respect to their own abilities. A person with imposter syndrome has a deep fear of being exposed as a fraud. Of course, if we look solely at the surface level dynamics of the film, it would seem that, yes, Adelaide is in fact an imposter. According to what we the viewers have witnessed, it is fairly clear that she is actually the underground dwelling doppelganger, and Red is her authentic human counterpart, so to speak. Adelaide pulled the old switcheroo in the House of Mirrors back when they were kids. At face value, the protagonist of this film is haunted by the fact that she's effectively taken the place of someone who rightfully deserves what she has. But I don't really think it makes sense to think of it explicitly in those terms. This film is asking you to look beneath the surface. With that in mind, I would assert that the entire film is like an abstract manifestation of Adelaide's imposter syndrome 
ramping up after returning to a childhood vacation spot. This place is a source of trauma in her life that triggers her feelings of being an imposter. What is driving Adelaide to feel this way? Well, it's not entirely clear, but if I had to guess, I would say it is rooted in some kind of deep anxiety caused by the idea that she's an inadequate mother, that she simply can't live up to some idea in her head of what a good parent should be. As far as I can tell, this anxiety doesn't really map onto reality. By all indications, Adelaide is a great wife and mother. But when imposter syndrome manifests, it doesn't really have an immediately obvious rationality to it. In terms of Adelaide's psychological makeup, you might say she has internalized a certain parental dynamic from her childhood. Namely that her father was inadequate, you know, because he lost track of her at the pier. And there is some indication that he has an avoidant personality. Though we don't actually know what kind of father he was on a day-to-day -day basis. So again, there's not much of an indication that these feelings really map onto reality. There is also the possibility that Adelaide's feelings of being an imposter stem from her feeling like a totally different person after a certain traumatic experience. You know, she doesn't speak after this event, and the doctor does suggest she has symptoms of PTSD. So this behavior is entirely consistent with the possibility that something really bad actually did happen to her. You know, a certain way to look at it is that the film has manifested a sort of ad hoc rationalization for why Adelaide acts this way. The film's logic is that she's been replaced by a doppelganger. But could it be that this whole House of Mirrors switcheroo is an event that serves as a stand-in for some other traumatic experience? Something that Adelaide hasn't come to terms with even as an adult. One thing that is clear to me is that in her adult life, Adelaide has made a sort of emotional overcorrection with respect to her own familial dynamic with her husband and children. But through the symbolic act of killing Red, this representation of herself that she's conjured up in a sort of horrific fever dream, Adelaide is able to overcome her feelings of inadequacy or inauthenticity, at least for the time being. But more than that, her various actions over the course of the film work to demonstrate what she values, and thus she is able to assert some sense of an authentic identity. Though it's not one that's entirely self-constructed, strictly speaking. But nonetheless, Adelaide at least has a better sense of what she can do and what lengths she is really willing to go to in order to protect her family by the end of the film. Not only is she able to effectively protect her kids, she also at least tries to protect her doppelganger son in one climactic scene. Thus, she rejects the troublesome paradigm by which her identity was challenged in the first place. To be sure, this required a really arduous conflict to play out, and the end of the film is ambiguous at best. I mean, it's looking like society itself has been upended. The world looks quite different after this conflict, and what's to come after this is anyone's guess. So too can we understand the film with respect to the larger societal dynamics at play. The interplay between surface and subsurface in the film speaks to the tension between various societal forces. You might even say that the film is about coming to terms with your own oppression, whatever form that may take. Now, as I previously stated, I view these doppelgangers as representations of their surface-dwelling counterparts. But what does that really mean with respect to these larger societal forces at play? Well, perhaps these doppelgangers represent certain horrific possibilities. Things that could have gone wrong in the course of the family's existence over time. There's this lie we're often fed that the U.S. is a meritocracy. That people's economic status is generally tied to their competence, their abilities. This myth belies a far more fundamental problem with our economic system. Namely, the whole thing is contingent upon the exploitation of the working class. The notion that people generally rise to the level of their abilities is an ideological rationalization for why things are the way they are, why some people have more than others. It's essentially a justification for the class system. And, by the way, I'm not saying a meritocracy would be a good thing if it were actually realized. In fact, Michael Young, 
the guy who invented the term, wasn't advocating for a meritocratic society either. He thought it would be a dystopian nightmare. In 2001, Young said, It is good sense to appoint individual people to jobs on their merit. It is the opposite when those who are judged to have merit of a particular kind harden into a new social class without room in it for others. The point here is the mere existence of these doppelgangers flies in the face of this meritocratic myth. You know, these people are exact copies of the Wilson family. They presumably have the same abilities, or at least the same potential. Yet, due to the circumstances they were born into, the doppelgangers have had horrible lives. The fact that the Wilson family hasn't wound up like their doppelgangers is largely a matter of chance. The horrific truth is that the Wilson family could have just as easily wound up like their doppelgangers. Disturbed, damaged people, born into a hellish situation, people who not only lack the material comforts of their surface world counterparts, but also the agency to remedy the situation. That is, until Red comes along and organizes a mass movement. At its best, works in the realm of horror have a unique ability to touch on something in the zeitgeist, something real, something that causes anxiety. At its core, the source of horror in this film is lack of control for the main characters. You know, these subsurface people didn't ask to be born, and they didn't exactly volunteer to participate in this bizarre experiment. But in a way, that's also true of the Wilson family. None of us have control over the material conditions that we're born into. And beyond an individual level, we just don't have control over the major factors that shape our everyday lives. This is a realization that perhaps isn't consistent with the way in which these characters view themselves. You know, to see yourself as a potential victim, even just a victim of circumstance, is not necessarily the most empowering thing. To recognize that one's agency is fairly limited can be a challenge. Each of the family members have doppelgangers in order to demonstrate to them just how bad things can really get. But I wouldn't say it's like, uh, gee, aren't you lucky for what you have type situation. It's important to note that this situation is not the result of some natural disaster. It's a product of social relations. It was caused by people and it was facilitated by the state apparatus. I find this idea of a social class whose existence is contingent upon a decidedly lower class to be fairly apt in relation to this whole two bodies, one soul paradigm presented in the film. The logic of the movie dictates that these clones are tethered to their surface level counterparts through some mechanism by which there's only one soul, one driving agent. Thus, agency itself becomes a scarce resource something to fight over. Most people find themselves at the raw end of just such a dynamic in everyday life. The truth is that the modern workplace is something of a dictatorship. In large part, we are driven to action by forces completely outside of our control. But again, we're not talking about some naturally occurring phenomenon here. We're talking about how our economy is organized. And so too is that a matter of social relations. The final shot of the movie depicts the underground people holding hands in a long line of succession that encompasses some fairly hazardous terrain. I believe it's a mountainous region in the Pacific Northwest. It's a surreal moment that stands out in a film chock full of surreal moments. This human chain calls to mind a historical event in the film that is first referenced in the opening scene. It's a reference that I would say is critical to the understanding of the film's meaning. Hands Across America was a campaign held in 1986 intended to help alleviate homelessness and hunger in the United States. The campaign centered around a massive event in which approximately 6.5 million people held hands in an enormous chain across the country. The benefit raised a whopping $34 million. But the optics of this event don't quite match up with the reality of the situation. After it was all said and done, less than half of the proceeds actually went to local charities. I think it's fair to say that the pervasiveness of such problems in the U.S. is indicative of deeper foundational problems with our society. 
Homelessness, for instance, can be tied to a lack of affordable housing in the country. So too can it be tied to the pervasiveness of mental illness. In the case of us, I would say the impracticality of the situation depicted in the final scene produces a surreal effect. You know, it'd be awfully difficult, if not downright impossible, to organize a demonstration of this scale, especially through this arduous terrain. And I might further speculate that this scene, which I think it's fair to say the entire film has been leading up to, might serve quite aptly as a commentary on a certain form of utopian thought in the US. In particular, I think this film takes aim at a naive vision of national unity that is specific to America. It's a view that ignores or glosses over the material reality of our present situation. It is evinced in the hollow words of politicians who say we should come together but don't actually grapple with the challenges that prevent us from doing so. Poverty is a very real and serious problem in the U.S. And it's one that is often glossed over as some kind of peripheral issue by the media. Since the 1930s, the U.S. has consistently exceeded other nations in relative poverty rates. In 2017, there were 39.7 million people living in poverty. And recent census figures indicate that approximately one in five millennials live in poverty. These are all interrelated problems and they're not so easily addressed with any one simple policy change. These problems can only really be solved through transformative change. Namely, I would say that a reorganization of our economic system is in order. In the film, the hopes and dreams of a generation are represented by hands across America. And it's certainly a beautiful idea. But you know, if this film says anything, it's that coming together in this manner will require a very difficult, perhaps even painful kind of reckoning that those who are already living comfortably might be a little reluctant to undertake. That wraps it up for this installment of Nightmare Masterclass. If you enjoy my videos and have a few bucks to spare, please consider supporting me on ko-fi.com forward slash Nightmare Masterclass. Any donation, large or small, is highly appreciated. Thank you for watching and good night.